When Rosie Greer, a defensive tackle, says he can't wrestle the gun out of a 160-pound man's hand, one hand, had one hand grip on it, and I, Rosie Greer could not get the gun out of his hand. By all accounts, that's a symptom of being under hypnosis. He also has no recollection of any of it happening, which is a symptom of being under hypnosis. None of the Kennedy kids think he did it. Not that that's a symptom of being under hypnosis, but like from the jump, he didn't know if he was guilty or not, got a terrible trial with a ridiculous defense attorney because all he could say was, I don't know. So they were like, well, you know, basically you did it. Like you killed freaking Robert F. Kennedy. And he had no recollection. His story never changed. He never failed a lie detector test. He never changed his tone. A note as we welcome you to this conspiracy edition of the NJ Criminal Podcast. Every time I say South Carolina in the Lee Oswald story, I mean North Carolina. We will be providing you links to research materials, uh, reference materials, and books all along the way, so please enjoy the show. I know... I know I'm excited about the 60th anniversary of Kennedy's assassination. I know I probably brought it up to you, but... but where where are you on the scale of, for example, you know, the initial report, the Warren Commission, which I find is oddly, oddly embraced to this day, even though there's been like four subsequent commissions, notable ones like the House uh, Select Committee on Assassination. That's 1975. And so there's subsequent, far more transparent, far more just substantive good faith investigations on record that say no there was almost certainly more than three shots and there was a, certainly a conspiracy but it's odd where you're still kind of fighting this overwhelming tide of oh it's well the Warren Commission report is if that's not even the official report anymore are you like me where all this stuff when we were little kids about it, like I felt like we were finally owed an explanation and there was a law in t passed about the records being released in 2017 and nobody's followed through on that, which only serves to make me think there's, you know, fuckery afoot. <laughs> um, Oliver Stone made a movie. I think it was called JFK. Uh, it had Kevin Costner in it. Um, it, it's a great movie. Um, I don't know how much of it is accurate and how much of it is Hollywood, but the movie is fantastic. Um, Jim uh, Garrison. Jim Garrison was the uh, Jim Garrison, the, 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 yeah, the DA, he, DA in New Orleans, and he had yes. the only attempted prosecution of a conspiracy of the assassination with his much ridiculed and maligned trial of Clay Shaw. But the, if you read Jim Garrison's book. On the Trail of the Assassins by Jim Garrison. The thing that stands out to you most is everywhere they went. For example, they'll, they'll go to the phone company to get a phone record. And that, that the, the record they want, that's the only page missing from that account's history. Everywhere they would peek their nose, someone had peeked their nose first and made things disappear in a way that you have to like how 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 could everywhere we go to follow a lead to get a what we think is going to be a smoking gun piece of evidence somebody's ahead of us and for some reason it literally it'll just be a record disappeared out of a cabinet but you're you're done you're done that lead is now and that was jim garrison's story overwhelmingly um but his book is great in that it reads like a true crime novel um, he talks about his team. It turns out his team, he had a mole on his team and that was the issue. That was why he had, he had a fed on his team that he was unaware of who was keeping other interests ahead of his own investigation. But nothing weird about that though. I mean, but yeah, Jim Garrison, that, and I would say that movie was, was probably more accurate than, than you would think. I'm sure there's embellishments, but I do think he put a lot of focus on the right places, which is, well, you have to if it's a garrison story. But the New Orleans mob is the only mob in the country that doesn't need permission from the other families for a national hit or to kill another family head. 
Like they don't need permission from anybody to do anything because they were the oldest first mob family in the country. And um, also because Lee Oswald had a long history and a ton of contacts in New Orleans of all sorts of descriptions. I mean, he had friends who were like communist sympathizers and pro, pro Castro. And then he had friends who were like militant right wingers. And he, he lived <clears throat> and worked in a circle that overlapped with a lot of people from the movie JFK in terms of Clay Shaw, that office. I want to say who was the private investigator who, but it's, it's, that's a wonderful book. I think you might enjoy it because you probably know way more of sort of, of what that guy's daily would, would have been like as an investigator, but I found it awesome. And to think it's a true story, it really did re like a fictional true crime, but it's just his perspective is, is, is enlightening and a wonderful book. Yeah. That's, uh, that's on the trail of the assassins by Jim Garrison. That the Amazon link will be below. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, the, the thing, so with JFK, what I, I think we've talked about this before. Um, if we're the government, we suck at everything. Um, if you had three government workers in a room, they couldn't agree where to go to lunch. The fact that they would be able to keep all the actors and um, participants and everybody in a large scale conspiracy cover up silent is to me, that's the not feasible part, unless you just kill everybody that. That that part I could believe, but the, there are the, nineteen witnesses from Dealey Plaza who die in the three years following the assassination. The odds of that were accounted to be something like two hundred thousand trillion to one. Nobody kept anything quiet. Would be my response, Chris. I mean, there was stinkery afoot from day one, and to have the director of the FBI. De declare a case closed in less than 24 hours that alone is enough to put enough stink on something that there were people asking questions and of the warren commission report that information is essentially a narrative but the 26 supporting volumes of warren commission testimony are full of people who contradict the warren report it's chock full of people who the Warren report didn't put in their final, final, the people who said, no, I saw, I saw a guy shooting and they're like, okay, thanks. We'll, we'll talk to you <laughs> if we need you. And, and these people oftentimes were later interviewed. Um, there are the two women who handled the phone, the last phone call of Lee Harvey Oswald. So there is, it's suspected and it's near confirmed there's all sorts of public record information that says oswald was cia and that's not conspiracy theory fringe that's no that's the cia having to backtrack in a congressional testimony when confronted with the fact that when they said oswald was in mexico no he was actually here you know and when presented with a memo that proves that cia folds it up puts it in his pocket walks out that committee doesn't do squat about it and that's on record congressional record you've got people who from day one who not many in terms of um like the press so the press comes out and a lot of them are like oh we people heard this there were shots all kinds of shots the first gun that they presented on tv was a mauser within two right yeah, it was a rifle, right? A bolt action. It was a bolt action Mauser is the yeah. first gun that they had on a police report. Within 24 hours, that cha changes to a Manlicker Carcano piece of shit. And so the original police report has a, a Mauser. The second, oh, from there on, though, it's a Manlicker Carcano. And you can see the difference in the pictures. The Mauser has a, a strap mount beneath it at both mounting points. The Manlicker Carcano has strap mounts on the side. And so these are the pictures taken by the Dallas PD. So how does that happen? That just doesn't get talked about. But there were people at the time, just to refute, who who did, there were Dallas police officers dropping dead by the score for the next decade. 
One of the chiefs got shot at multiple times. And sometimes it wasn't because they didn't go along after the first day. It was because they were on record saying one thing within the first six hours or 10 hours or 12 hours that didn't fit the narrative that uh, the FBI threw down within 24 hours, basically declaring the case closed. But there are, you know, there are reporters with mysterious deaths along the way who are questioning this. Dorothy Kilgallen, who was one of the most famous women in America. Ernest Hemingway called her the greatest female writer on the planet. And she was also the star of this like game show talk show called What's My Line. And she was one of the few people doing an earnest investigation of the JFK assassination. And she had just flown down to New Orleans and written one of her friends a letter saying, I just broke up in the whole thing. And she's 48 hours later, she's found, you know, overdosed by like a hundred pills, except she hadn't vomited. There were a bunch of weird things about that scene. And Dan Rather, initially, Dan Rather was not, was reporting that there were multiple people. And then he became one of the biggest voices for like, you're a nut if you think. And I think Dan Rather built his career on, on, on doing what he was told when this story came out, because his initial reporting was was very contrary to what the official story became. And essentially, this was the first building block of his big old career. And by the time you get through this, if if any of the conspiracies are remotely correct, then yeah, Dan Rather was a straight up shill for a conspiracy. But it wouldn't make him the only one. I mean, the number of like really weird deaths around it, and sometimes they're only weird because every other person in their circle died. And you've got you've got those CIA are, testimony of a weird. guy. Yeah, well, that's what I'm saying. If every other person in their work group, like guy who FBI guy tells his daughter, listen, whatever happens to me when I die, it wasn't an accident. And no, I'm going to die by accident. He gets shot in his backyard. It's a hunting accident by a kid who's been hunting those woods for 20 some years. And it's. The whole the that investigation was was it's a shady story unto itself. But like, there's too many FBI guys telling their family, "When I die, it wasn't an accident," and especially because they were getting subpoenaed in the mid '70s by the um, uh, House Select Committee on Assassinations. You had five FBI guys die within the course of six months, and one of them died by suicide, two shots to the head while he jumped out of a boat. Two. That's that's in the coroner's report for the love of God. So, um, it's I would I would say it hasn't been quiet. It's just a choice of how how much you're willing to dig into the record. And there's evidence of this in how artificial intelligence presents information around the JFK assassination. Is, for example, the CIA has admitted to and apologized for controlling newsrooms for three decades on this topic. They had to apologize to investigative reporters. Um, Mark Lane, I think, was one of them. But they said, yeah, we were paying reporters to lie about the assassination for decades, you know, and that we were controlling newsrooms. Um, so that's what artificial intelligence has to draw from in terms of an evidence base for it to bring in a consensus and create intelligent information. And so it's been really interesting having it write content about the JFK assassination, where it will give weight to the Warren Commission above anything else, just because that's been the standard line. And so there's nine times more content sitting out there right. about it than the House Select Committee on Assassinations. So I'll say things to it like, Research how the CIA controlled the narrative of the JFK assassination. Can you figure that into how you weight your commentary when I ask you to do a command? It, and it basically responds with, wow, that's fucked up. But it does disclaim. And so it'll say crazy things that contradict the Warren Commission, but then it'll say, but and everything's a basically a conspiracy theory, and there's no reason not to trust the Warren Commission. When why are we talking about the Warren Commission if there's been four subsequent commissions, for God's sakes? So I did not, I didn't even know that, and um, it, you know, it's interesting because 
I definitely think the Warren Commission has like the best image in terms of that it was a big investigation and it was uh, congressional and uh, they had, you know, the most resources and the most power. I mean, I know there have been smaller private ones of journalists and historians who've dug into it and gotten lots of documents and interviewed people. Um, I've seen some interesting slowdowns too of the, um, the Zapruder film. And, you know, it's, it's only as, as good as the technology where they, they just slow it down, uh, as much as they can and go frame by frame. And, uh, it, that's pretty interesting. I mean, the event, the event is not in dispute. It's, um, you know, who, where, what direction, how high. Um, you know, I, it, th there are certain things about it. There are certain lexicon words that come from that um, grassy when knoll. You, when you need a magic bullet in yeah. your story... You when you yeah, need the word bullet. magic in your story, you got a you yeah. got a preposterous story in in a in a in a legal environment. Is all I'm saying. Yeah, the magic the magic bullet. Uh, you know, um, the man on the grassy knoll. You know these these terms that um, everybody knows that it's just when when you say it, that's you know what you're uh, you're referencing, which is just crazy. I mean. Um, even if you just said something that doesn't have anything to do related with um, crime, book depository. I mean, it, to me, that that's the first the first thing. First of all, I don't think there's ever been a, another book depository anywhere on Earth except on that street because I never have heard it, and it's always referenced that way when they talk about it. It it was just basically a a large building where I think the school board kept uh, textbooks. Some but, people call um, that a warehouse. Oh, a warehouse. Yeah. Book, book um, so depository. There is, and I'll, I'll have to correlate this to one of the titles I read, but there is a, the whole handling of the Zapruder film. That's a book in itself. And there's a great deal of evidence that that, that was tampered with. In fact, there is a, a strong argument to be made that the only reason it appears as though he jerked mightily in any direction is because they removed the frames where his head was basically a fountain entirely. And so uh, eyewitnesses said matter was shooting five feet straight up in the air all over the place. And if you look at Jackie Kennedy, matter was shooting all over the place. But and you see, you see s s damage, but the eyewitness testimony speaks to basically an explosion that goes up. And his head goes, and, and the idea being that is, is he just, a after his head sort of frankly exploded, then he slumped to the left. But they, they skipped a bunch of stuff, and he, it appears though he jerks to the left. I want to say it was Kodak up in New York State, Albany. No, but there's a there's and they were doing processing for like U2 missions and stuff like that. And that's where it got developed. And there were people who were sent there to get it developed on two occasions. And there was a chain of custody that is disrupted in that story. And the people who went the first time didn't know about the people who went the second time. And there are, and well, and no, it was openly, uh, it was like a news item. There were frames reversed at one point and they said that was a processing mistake. But there's, there's a number of far more eloquently done dissertations on just the handling and technology around uh, the lo the Kodak location in New York, who usually sent them stuff to process? Was it law enforcement or was it the CIA? And who did that? Who was their customer essentially? And yeah, the chain of command and that's or chain of command chain of custody is is very sort of 
wacky, which it shouldn't be. This was kind of a big deal. So you think they would have that pretty tight. But that's in terms of the Zapruder film, the craziest thing I've heard is that there are frames missing. And that's why it looks like he jerks to the left because they weren't going to show his head fountaining all over the place. Hmm. It's uh, what's interesting to me. It's in that Oliver Stone film is uh, there's like a palm print on the side of the rifle, um, which uh, somebody somebody did processing of it first. And he Jim Garrison's uh, character in the film references, you know, that uh, it was processed uh, for latent fingerprints and then. Um, and there was nothing, but then, oh, wait, no, there's an entire palm print on uh, on the other side that was later, later discovered or discovered by a second examiner or something. Um, that was that was pretty interesting to me because it's like, how do you how do you miss an entire palm print on on a weapon, you know, uh I mean, when when you watch that movie uh, at the end, you're you're really like, man, I don't, I don't know. I mean, it's uh, it's just so interesting, and and then Kevin Costner is great in it, and and how they string everything together, and all the the shady people that they're re-interviewing and talking to, um, and you know, and but then you tie in the you know, that Jack Ruby comes out of nowhere and, you know, during the perp walk, uh, kills Oswald, you know, of the, the perp walk of the most important suspect in the history of the United States in a jailhouse in the, in the basement parking lot of a police station is able to glide right in, brandish a weapon, get it to the point where it's center mass while he's within two feet of nine different law enforcement officers. And I can't blame him. If none of them were in on it, I'd have been as surprised as, as, as anybody if I was them. But it seems odd that he could get from point A to point B and nobody say, look, man, this isn't the day for you to be hanging out. Like, how does that not happen? You know, the, how does that not happen? And then it's, that's in the jailhouse. The other you know, fun thing that takes place is he doesn't get a lawyer in the jailhouse. He he protests his innocent from the get, get, calls himself a patsy from the jump, and requests a lawyer from the jump. The only phone call he makes is to South Carolina, and it doesn't get connected. The women who worked for the phone company later came out and told their stories and said two men in suits came in, sat down. They said, okay, take the call. And they said, now give it to me. And they never plugged it in. They never connected the call. And that's the testimony of these two women who were operators at the time in the room at the time. Why they chose to say that, they said it. And I, I think it's tough to argue why. I, to my knowledge, they didn't get rich saying it. And I don't right. know that their lives were going to get better by saying something like that. The I can tell you, and I'm dying to come up with the senator's name, but it was always sub um, the suspicion or the best theory I've heard, frankly, is that Oswald was part of a fake defector program. The fake defector program has been confirmed by United States senators on record during interviews to have been run out of South Carolina. How does a guy who walks into the U.S. embassy and says, I'm defecting to Russia, I have better than top clearance for U2 stuff. I know where troops are. He had better than top secret clearance related to U-2 spy plane missions. Tells the embassy, I'm going to defect. Goes to Russia, marries a girl within two weeks whose uncle is part of the Russian intelligence community. Shortly thereafter, returns to the United States, is welcomed with open arms, given clearance, and in no way, shape, or form hindered, investigated, or disrupted in any way ever having, after having disavowed the United States of America. In fact, he was met in Hoboken, New Jersey, upon his return from Russia by a known government go-between who instructed him to go meet a gentleman by the name of George de Morinshield. George de Morinshield 
was known CIA, George de Mornshield in his late life wrote a letter to George Bush Sr. when he was head of the CIA begging him, I think the quote was, you know, just make this go away. I'm always being followed. But literally got met in Hoboken, New Jersey by somebody with government ties, told to go hang out with another guy with government ties down in Texas. And de Morinshield was is widely um, is widely uh, suspected or known to be his handler. Uh, de Morinshield killed himself under wacky circumstances. But that aside, who tells the United States government, "I'm out. I'm going to Russia during the Cold War," right? With you two top secret clearance, marrying a Russian girl, coming right back. And I'm welcomed with open arms. I mean, that's as preposterous, preposterous as anything else in the story at, at, at face value when you really think about it. During the Cold War, this happened, and he didn't get a the, second the, look. The thing about that story that makes me feel like he was um, just kind of mentally ill is if you're going to defect in secret, why would you go and announce that you're defecting? That kind of that kind of yeah, takes the clandestine part out of it. Not if the not no because he he told that to the Americans. Every American embassy was bugged during the Cold War. He was doing that because he was trying to get the Russians to think he was a fake defector. That's the that's the presumption is that he walked into the embassy knowing it was bugged and said, "Look." I just want you to know I'm I'm done as a citizen. I'm going over there. These are things I know. I, I don't know if I'm going to, you know, what I'm going to tell them, but just so you know, I'm out of here. And the idea would be that he knows that that's a direct line to Russian intelligence so that then hopefully he can go over there and. Oh, okay. So he's like they, planning the seed. Like making himself bait. Okay. Okay. And so it's a false defector program. So even the guys at the embassy wouldn't have known. They he, they wouldn't have called ahead and say, listen, this guy's faking it. No, he'd have walked in there, let them be like, good Lord, man. And then um, knowing that that would hopefully, the, but the thinking on that is that the, he laid it on a little too thick, maybe. Like there's nothing subtle about that. And if Russian, Russia's been down this road, a thousand times at this point, or if they're suspicious about fake defectors, which clearly that had to be going on like mad, um, that once he was, they didn't buy it basically. Although he did get an interesting job over there in an interesting factory, um, having to do with defense, but even that's weird, but he comes back. Uh, it's just, it's just, it sounds like, the Russians were like, yeah, we're not buying it, but we'll just sort of see what goes on. And he comes back, sort of gets brought back into the intelligence community, and they start sending him down to New Orleans to do weird things like get into a fight pretending he's pro Castro while he's still hanging out with like crazy right wingers behind the scenes. Oh, yeah. That um, what was it fair play for Cuba, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yep. You... Yeah. That, that, and so fascinating but i i do think just going back to any assertion that there oh, are too many people involved and they kept it quiet no there were so many people involved and so many people who weren't quiet about it but there's really no benefit to not being quiet you weren't even going to sell a million books like um there's there's a story. Do you know who Irv Kupsinit is? He was a writer out of Chicago. He talked about sports a lot. He wrote he was famous like in the 60s, 70s when we were kids, and he was friends with some mobsters, apparently, and this is backed up by phone records. He called his mobster friends in Chicago. He lived in Chicago and was asking about, hey, were you guys involved in this? His daughter ended up dead within like a week, and he never talked about the JFK assassination again. And he was, prior to that, he was a very investigative type of guy. Like, he would stick his nose in. He was hard-nosed. After that, he never said a thing to anybody. He, he made one phone call to a mobster, and those records came out in probably some one of the investigations, probably not Warren. Yeah, his, his daughter died under wildly mysterious circumstances. Another, another very sketchy overdose where, like, 
even the, uh, you know, just physical characteristics of the room. I think again, lack of vomiting, things like that, that made it suspicious. But what's the upside in making a lot of noise about the JFK conspiracy stuff? Uh, hell, the word conspiracy got attached to this right away and you're a crazy, you're a nut, that kind of thing. To well, the and that's very- the, that's how you discredit anybody who, you know, has information is, you know, you, uh, attack their character, you know, that they're a a bad person or they're a criminal or they're, uh, associate with, with bad people. So then even if they have good information about something, if it damages their credibility, uh, in any, in any scenario, you know, um, it, it's easier to discredit them if, if it, if it goes that way. Um, the the most interesting thing to me because i think evidence conspiracies are hard to prove the the most inter- interesting thing to me was and i would love if somebody would be able to do it is if you could somehow block off that whole area uh, on that road because i believe that road is still there in dallas and there's like a bridge and h- how that motorcade went and if you could get um a vehicle and have mannequins in it. And if you could put somebody in the window that they think that he is in uh, or, or was in, and if he could, if that basically, if they could reconstruct the shooting in that way, not with computers. No, they've done that with the, with the, with the best shooters in the world that they could get. They did all the, all the geometry about it has been done to the letter so they know what distances and they they did it nobody could do it nobody could do that's it that's what they, that's they, to me they, that's the interest that's the interesting short, part is then they shorten the distance by half and like right. one guy could do it right um, that, that's the most interesting part to me is if is this uh replicatable you know that um you're shooting with an antiquated weapon at great distance that is not a bolt action. No, well, I mean, he had some military training, but... Um, he had the I, bare basic qualifications. The word marksman does not mean you're a marksman. It means you're, right. you're basic, basic he, qualifications. That you so that's what they all, Yeah, they're always like, oh, he was a, he was a marksman in the, in the Marines. Yeah, yeah like, there, well, there's different... Marksman, um, marksman means he passed the basic shooting class. The basic shooting. Now, now, I will tell you, though... Um, Marines can hit uh, a silhouette at 500 yards with iron sights, but um, the the distance, the trajectory, and the um, the three what do we say three shots? And it was what uh, the president, Jackie, and was it Senator Connolly, a uh, governor, um, Governor Connolly. Um, who, and, and he was struck. He was struck as well. I think in the wrist. Um, he had shattered ribs. He had a shattered wrist, and he had a uh, he had a bullet in his leg when when the dust settled. Yeah, I I really um, and and what and they're saying three rounds basically. Well, yeah, and one of, one of them created like five holes between the two of them. But it's it, that's I don't I don't I don't think that's on the table anymore i don't think the warren commission like acoustic findings or ballistic findings hold any water and i i I think honestly i i don't i don't think they have any credence whatsoever or any place in the debate at this point it's come on you found a pristine bullet rolling out of a body in the hospital. Oh, by the way, I'm, I'm not sure he was on oh, that's that right. journey. That's right. They, yeah. yeah oh, they, hey, there's a bullet. Come on, dude. The bullet that shattered a wrist is in one piece. Uh, here's the other thing. The, the weight of the bullets pieces at the end of the day weighed more than three bullets. Okay. Three I see bullets. what you're saying. You know, that. But alone. they were committed. They were committed to the number three for whatever reason. So. Because anything more than three and you've got two shooters, anything it was like they're using words like magic that one guy pulled it off. So more than three shots would have had to have definitely been a team. 
And that's why it had to be. That's why all the witnesses, there's a guy who worked for the train company right behind the book depository. There's tracks. He's in a tower watching a guy behind the fence in the parking lot up the hill on top of the grassy knoll, a shooter. He died. He's the one who saw the white, he saw the white smoke over the fence. No, no. He was behind the fence watching from behind. So okay, a, fem- was, a female witness saw the white smoke. A bunch of people saw white smoke. A bunch of people saw white smoke. Um, and a bunch of people saw multiple people in the window on the sixth floor. One gentleman was described as dark skin, could have been Latino, could have been black. But that's could that's in this conversation. It makes you wonder if that could have been somebody who was part of the Cuban program. That was originally supposed to assassinate Castro because those are the teams and the plans that they used to kill JFK. This was a, this whole so, thing was a Castro assassination program that was set up by JFK and signed off on by JFK. And those exact management um, teams, they, they first they tried Chicago, then they tried Miami and Tampa. And and there was a Department of Defense team that stopped all those assassination attempts. And they were sent, sending another team, not Secret Service. Yeah, I, I want to say it was, there were assassination interdiction teams in addition to Secret Service sent to all these who stopped plots they knew of. And they failed in wow. Dallas. But the three previous visits JFK made, he acknowledged he was having conversations with people about whether or not, and they did cancel. They, I want to say they canceled in Florida even doing something because they didn't foil who was involved. But there, there are people arrested in, was it Chicago or was it Miami, the guy who got arrested, whose whole previous three-year mes- resume matched Oswald's almost to a T in terms of all his behaviors, who he had been linked with in terms of what they were into. And so uh, it appears they may have had multiple Oswalds in multiple locations, and he was the Dallas Patsy. They had probably a Miami Patsy, a Tampa Patsy, a Chicago Patsy, because these are all places where there were known plots acknowledged by the Kennedys. They discussed it in, in cases they went, in cases they canceled, but they did not want to cancel Dallas. Well, here we are today. I think it made things a little different, but it is, it is, if you read a bunch of books, you realize, oh, there were people talking about this all the time. There, there were people like immediately after saying, uh, to their kids, like, oh, beware, I'm probably going to get whacked. And there were FBI agents 10 years later committing suicide with two bullets in the head while they jump off a boat, um, because they were on a subpoena list so that they just got wiped out. And that's all kind of public record stuff um and when you put it all together it's kind of interesting or it sounds batshit crazy it's definitely Mm -hmm. one of the two depending on who you're talking to and i i realize i get so excited by the topic because to me it's like a crime mystery so i'm like and then this and this and and people are probably like dude you're talking about do you like you're way too excited for this topic and i think that that i don't know how much that takes away from my own credibility but i've i've read all the books that i can get my hands on and on sort of both sides of the story, I, I just, I can't, so preposterous using words like magic for that one side that I basically just swept it, swept it off at this point. When, when people who provide information that is, is small, uh, a small piece of the puzzle, um, either mysteriously are murdered or die in some weird accident, uh, that that's interesting. You know, the shot in the head twice off the boat, you know, uh, a heart attack, uh, you know, fell asleep on the road, drove off the road, uh, carjacking victim or whatever. And you're like, that that's pretty weird. I mean, because like if you looked at, say, your high school photo, uh, like I have a class photo. I had a pretty big graduating class, like 400 kids um, 20 years later, 30 years later, 40 years later were you know, were 200 of them murdered or committed suicide? Because, like, you think about it statistically in a population, how many people would, you know, be the victim of an accident, the victim of a crime, or take their own life? So if you have this one small 
population where the only thing they have in common is that they were affiliated with certain people or worked at a certain place or had a certain job. And then 20 years later, uh, out of 100 of them, 98 of them, um, excuse me, are deceased. The, statistically, just definitely an outlier. That's the Dealey Plaza math. It's it's 19 people at a Dealey Plaza. But then the rings go concentric because once committees start showing up and subpoenas start going out, that's when the, the just mass death starts happening in the Kennedy assassination story. It's it's people just got wiped out there in the 70s whose names are relevant to this story. And whether they were mobsters, whether they were FBI big shots, whether they were suspected CIA, that kind of thing. Or oh, it was just so many. I want to say like probably at least a dozen related to the House Select Committee on Assassinations because there's five FBI and not all the FBI stories are, you know, they were all deemed heart attack or accidental shot by a hunting or suicide shot twice in the head jumping out of a boat. That's the most ridiculous one. What I would be interested in is, so I can't remember the officer's name. So basically, after the shooting, Oswald Pitt. flees the book depository and a Dallas patrolman, for some reason, decides to check out with Oswald, basically do like what we call a FIR, like basically get out with him, talk to him, uh, check his identification, and um pretty quickly into the contact uh oswald shoots and kills that officer and then um he is ultimately arrested in a movie theater in dallas but i i'm was curious to know like what and that to me because that's the cop part in me like what is the chain of events like how how do you go from an area that's far away from where the shooting occurred to an officer getting out with this man who's just walking in the daytime. Um, the officer is murdered and then they descend on this theater that he's in and then he's in custody. And then very quickly they're saying that, Oh yeah. And he shot, you know, officer Smith. Oh, and the president. You know, and it's like, what it was, how did, what, what Tippett. connect, Tippett off? Yeah, JD Tippett. And so Tippett yes. was a part, uh, also was a bouncer. He worked for Jack Ruby at Jack Ruby's strip club, uh, as a bouncer. Tippett and Jack Ruby are possibly some of the more compelling keys to the whole story being obvious bullshit. And so, for one thing, he shared a, he, he was living in Dallas, I want to say like, Five days. Yeah, like he he rented a and room from a, a lady. His, his landlady used to gossip with the. So she was friends with the wives of the cops who had that sort of patrol beat in their car, and you probably got a neat code for that. And then um, she saw that day. She reported in her testimony that a, a cop car stopped in front of the house when Lee had run home and honked she thought it was going to be the husband of one of her friends so she went and peeked said the number was wrong said i can't tell you what the number was but i can tell you it wasn't this number because that's jack's unit or whatever so she just ignored it and then um if there were no other patrol cars anywhere near that area and that's in the general area where obviously Tippett gets shot. Oswald was, or Tippett was not supposed to be anywhere near there at that time. That was not his patrol area at the time he got shot. Furthermore, the very first forensic analysis of the scene in terms of somebody picking up a cartridge or a casing rather and looking at it said, this is an automatic weapon. He got shot with an automatic weapon. That's the very first impression, and I believe there were too many shots for a revolver, according to witness testimony, because people heard Tippett get shot. Eyewitnesses said they watched a man in certain slacks, certain shirt, 
and certain jacket walk away from the scene after walking around the front of the car, putting a kill shot in him and reloading his gun, walking away. None of those elements fit the description of Oswald, but those don't make it into the Warren Commission report. Those are in the 26 volumes of reference resources for the Warren Commission. Every bit, if you looked at just the Tippett shooting as a crime scene, you would, you personally, I think you'd be done with the Warren Commission report. If you just read about the J.D. Tippett shooting and how ridiculous and preposterous the story around that is, why would that be faked? Why would that be covered up? Why would that be in any way not a transparent investigative element? It's part of this whole assassination thing. Um, and that's not even getting into the part where it probably would have been physically impossible for him to cover the ground. Okay, to possibly. walk the distance. Yeah. To cover yeah. to cover the distance from his uh, the uh, assassination shooting to... The I mean, basically, a good rule of thumb is uh, a healthy adult. You can walk a mile in about 15 minutes. Yeah. So um, when when we would uh, be out on the road and we would have some kind of crime, some kind of robbery or something where people are calling 911 um, and you're setting that perimeter, a lot of times I would look at the map, basically uh, push it out because if they say it occurred at 10 o'clock and they called at 10.05, push it back 20 minutes because first they panicked and freaked out and called their wife and then kind of walked around for a few minutes and were, were upset and crying and scared. And <laughs> so it, it, they're not being dishonest about what happened. They're just they're trying to tell you quickly, but more time has elapsed than they realized. And so you're, you know, it just happened. It just happened. He just ran off. That is really five or 10 minutes ago. So you would set that perimeter out further because, you know, whatever they, they try to relay to you, you know, so uh, luckily where I work, um, it's like a grid system, the street. So it makes it easy to set perimeters now, but you know, if if it happened on second second avenue you don't want to put a police car on third avenue cuz he's already past he's past 10th you know what i mean yeah. like by the time you get set up so i i wonder what that that physical distance is between the room he was renting see now i'm going to have to read all these books um but to me oh, it, it's, it's the eyewitness eyewitness testimony is interesting but to me that is the least reliable like n because people not that they're lying but they interpret things they see things differently they attribute certain things to you know whatever um i like uh bullet holes shell casings blood spatter um things that are are um concrete that you can look at and review and th then you know uh like if you have a bpa expert you know you can figure out the math and they can't give you a perfect point of origin for it but they can give you a range and th those things then to me those things make your witness either credible or not you know like have you ever heard the term stippling yeah, 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 absolutely. So the, it's the burning from the gunpowder. So if if uh, I got shot right here and I have a black circle and then like a, a field of burnt powder that's burnt my skin and you say you and I got into a fight and you say uh, that I was coming at you with a shovel and I was but you shot me and you were 50 feet away, that's a contact wound or near contact within probably six inches. So that evidence then to me is, uh, determines your credibility of your testimony. That's, um, yeah, that'll come up when you read about the assassination of Robert F. Kennedy, when you look at what the official story is. And then when you, uh, read about the damage done basically by point blank, um, uh, what would you call it? A point blank discharge. Um, 
the kill shot was behind his right ear. It was described as just you know, as burned point blank. And um, Sirhan Sirhan was three to four feet away from him, pointing a gun at his chest. <laughs> That's the official. Now story. he was. He was. Uh, was he the attorney general when that happened? No, he was he was um, a senator at that point, but he had just just secured the Democratic primary. Um, I think he might have just secured the nomination in California, and so he was at the Ambassador Hotel, and uh, he was taken on a route that they weren't supposed to be taken on through a part of the hotel that they weren't supposed to go through, and there's Sirhan Sirhan waiting for him, uh, stands in front of him directly, starts firing shots, gets tackled by Rosie Greer, who's a professional football player, gets tackled by George Plimpton, who was a writer, personality, actor, slash CIA operative. His wife was there, um, but it, the whole room was packed. But all the – Sirhan Sirhan is in front of him shooting, and then even in the uh, autopsy – So I can – I can explain that. So you point your your pretend gun at me, your finger, and we're chest to chest, right? But what do I do? Maybe. So now so now you're one of your rounds that hits me here. That do you, you know well, what I mean? Here I hear you. But that doesn't explain the two. No, I'm not saying the it. There's, there's two more in behind him in his ribs. So as if, and just for example, if the police officer who was guiding him through that pantry by the right elbow happened to be a CIA agent, which it later came out in interviews that he was, he, he, trained, he trained Cuban dissidents for the Bay of Pigs invasion. That's just neither here nor there. So he's walking Bobby Kennedy through a pantry on the day Bobby Kennedy takes a bullet right where this guy's standing. I think it's boom, 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 and that's it. And there are eyewitnesses who said they watched. So, or he shot him in the body because there's two eyewitnesses who said a bellboy walked right up to Bobby Kennedy, put a gun to his head, and pulled the trigger. Multiple credible witnesses said, I watched. And one of them swears it's Sirhan Sirhan. He's like, no, I saw him do it. And they're like, no, he was in front of him. That's not the guy. He's like, he was wearing a white jacket, and I saw the whole thing. I saw Sirhan Sirhan shoot him. And they're like, sir, the guy in a white jacket, he, the, he was wearing a, a dark suit or something like that. So in that room, first of all, there's like four extra bullet holes. Everybody sees fire shooting out of his gun this far. In your quick hypothesis, Investigator, what would make a gun shoot fire out this far? Um, probably like if you had a hot load round in a short barrel weapon, like um, like you could shoot a three fifty seven round out of a thirty eight, but it's not designed to do that. Um, ultimately, you will damage the weapon. And it, I mean, it could potentially like frag in your hand, but, um, if somebody had made the rounds, um, sometimes I used to go to this one range where the guy who owned it would reload ammunition. And sometimes you would get a light one that was like a cap gun. It was like, Pah! and it didn't really have the bang to it. And then sometimes you would get what they call a heavy load where it had a little extra, gunpowder in it than it should for that size and it would make a really big difference so i would, would say heavy loaded self uh loaded bullets or a larger um was it a revolver or a semi -auto? Revolver. It was a revolver yeah so i i would say probably probably heavy heavy loaded um rounds in in a smaller weapon like what if you like i said what would blanks look like getting shot out of a short nose revolver? Um, because that's where I'm going. Is that he wasn't even he he didn't even have live ammunition. So blanks 
traditionally it it's a real like what they use on the movie sets it's um it's the casing there's gunpowder in there there's and a, a lot, primer so, so the um the hammer has some or the firing pin has something to strike to create that explosion but it doesn't have the projectile portion that actually shoots out the bullet you know so they can make their movie or or whatever um so that the element missing is the the bullet the projectile um would that would would so they in have you shot them cuz i i'm under the impression that a blank gun will give you that effect will give you a fire effect cuz it's it's paper wadding in there if nothing else right yes it does yeah it it gives it gives an effect of and that's what they need for the movies because uh you know they they need that burst that um but yeah but those rounds that are or the, not rounds the those um movie rounds don't have the projectile in it unless you're on the set of rust then it does i'm thinking of would they give the effect of shooting fire out because the the cons the conspiracy robert f kennedy jr believes what I'm about to tell you, that Sirhan Sirhan never fired a bullet. Uh, a bullet never left his gun, and all the damage came from behind, as all the medical reports say. But if you've, and the CIA, by the way, literally has magicians on staff, and their whole job is to teach you how to make everybody in the room look at one thing while you do something incredible in another part of the room. And that's what they think happened. But the problem is there's like 22 people in this tiny little pantry and a couple of them saw somebody put a gun right to the back of his head, went on record, testified. This woman, Bobby Plimpton, was married to a celebrity. There was no dirt on her, otherwise we would have found out in my reading that she's a crazy maniac. Perfectly reputable. So no, I saw somebody while Sir Hands over there pulling the trigger, I'm looking at Bobby Kennedy and a dude walked right up behind him, put a gun to his head, pulled the trigger. And so what, two eyewitnesses. What would, what would be the motivation, though, to get as far as to have a shooter in front of the person shooting blanks and then the real person behind him shooting? If you could get one person close enough face to face with him, why not just have him be your killer? Because like, they, what's well, the they benefit? Don't trust him. Well, the, because cause they just burned a, a lone nut. Because then there's they, you can get rid of the most important people in the country who are going to stop wars and cost a trillion dollars out of somebody's bank account by having somebody disappear and not having people look into it. It's the not having people look into it that arises by having a lone nut. And so a guy who had no history of hating the Kennedys, a guy who had no history of hating America, a guy who had, you know, a very mild mannered before a head injury, I should mention, um, that brought him into psychiatric treatment with a doctor who has a history of working for the CIA and also overlaps with the Charles Manson story, which again, just makes this sound batshit crazy. But one of the people who treated Sirhan Sirhan after he fell off a horse, hit his head on a post, and then went into this weird depression, started seeing a psychiatrist. Um, all he wanted to be was a jockey, by the way. But if you've got a guy who's dark skinned from a Middle Eastern country with a head injury, and you've got a doctor who can spot him and be like, hey, I got a, I got a, an opportunity for you for that thing you told me to watch out for, you wanted a guy like this with maybe some head injuries so we can program him, hypnotize him. When Rosie Greer, a defensive tackle, says he can't wrestle the gun out of a 160 pound man's hand, one hand, had one hand grip on it and I, Rosie Greer could not get the gun out of his hand. By all accounts, that's a symptom of being under hypnosis. He also has no recollection of any of it happening, which is a symptom of being under hypnosis. None of the Kennedy kids think he did it. Not that that's a symptom of being under hypnosis, but like from the jump, he didn't know if he was guilty or not, got a terrible trial with a ridiculous defense attorney because all he could say was, I don't know. So they were like, well, you know, basically you did it. Like you killed freaking Robert F. Kennedy. And he had no recollection. His story never changed. He never failed a lie detector test. He never changed his tone. Um, the Kennedy family's been campaigning to get him out of prison for 
decades, I think, because the story on its face is so preposterous. But that's where it gets weird. It, you, you've got a guy, and all these stories, including Lee Harvey Oswald, they all involve strip clubs and they all involve hypnosis. And I think that's where I think that's where the hypnosis was happening, or that's where their control was happening, because. Uh, Ruby owned a strip club and Sirhan Sirhan was seen in that kitchen and accompanied the whole night by what is described as a bombshell beauty. Like 1950s pinup beauty in a polka dot dress, just hanging out with Sirhan Sirhan all night. And that she was the one to give him a pinch, give him a poke or whatever, that he instantly goes into pull a gun mode and pulling the trigger. And he has no recollection of any of it. But there is crazy weird overlap around conversation about mind control, hypnosis, and well-documented programs that our government has now admitted to in subsequent decades that cover all these things in all these places during all these times. But you get any weirder than that, and, you know, people just don't know how to watch your YouTube video. They think you're a nut. <laughs> I... The, the Kennedy, the President Kennedy assassination was always, um, I, you know, saw it and read about it and thought about it. Well, if you, if you dig into any, and I'll send you a link, I'll have some Kennedy book recommendations live this week and I'll send you the link. But if you dig into any of that stuff and you want to argue with me about it, that'd be awesome. I just can't get enough. And I... I know this, I, I regret not recording some Kennedy stuff last year because the sooner I get it out, the more it'll get warmed up in the YouTube algorithm. But I do think when November rolls around, also with Robert F. Kennedy Jr. running for president, I think the topic of the 60th anniversary of JFK's assassination is gonna come up. The best way to follow, subscribe, rate, or message the show is to visit njcriminalpodcast.com. Don't forget to subscribe, because before you know it, we'll be back with another great conversation.